Um, this is a real pleasure for me. Thanks for thanks for letting me speak at the Nassau Institute. It's a, it's a real privilege. So what I want to talk about today is really, I think, a, a mystery. <coughs> a mystery that all of us who care about free markets, there's a, there's a whole community out there in the world where advocates of free markets, we, we're all challenged by this mystery. And the mystery is this. All the evidence suggests, and I'll talk a little bit about the evidence, all the evidence suggests that capitalism and free markets work, that they produce wealth, that they generate a middle class, that they allow poor people to rise up from poverty, that indeed there's never been an economic system, there's never been an economic social system in human history more beneficial to human life than free markets and capitalism. And yet, and yet, we in the West, in the Western world, are moving dramatically away from the system. Moving away from free markets. We're moving away from capitalism. And we've been doing so not just in the last few years, not just with the latest administration, or the, or the last, uh, you know, the, the, the last political shuffle. But we've been doing this for decades. In the United States, we've been doing it for 100 years. We've been moving away from capitalism. We've been moving away from free markets. And the question is, the mystery is, if you will, why? What is it that is causing these shifts? What is it that is driving a political establishment, really a culture, to be so antagonistic to an economic system that seems at least so good. What explains this dichotomy? Um, and it's, to many of us, this is quite baffling. Let me just say a few things about why I think capitalism is such a good system, why it works. Well, if we look, if you think about it, the last 250 years, since the middle of the 18th century, the world has been running a massive experiment. It's, we've been testing all kinds of economic systems, all kinds of political, social systems. The whole spectrum has been tried. And we've tested it. We've run an experiment. We've tried it in different countries. We've tried it across time. We've tried it in different continents. And We've got results. The data's in, if you will. Right? I mean, we've tried communism. We've tried fascism. And, and what's the result? What can we say about communism in terms of the consequences, the outcome? Design. They're bad, right? People die. Tens of millions of, dollars of people die. Tens of millions of people die of starvation. And the people who don't die, what's the standard of living like under communism? It's horrible. It's filled with poverty. Everybody's standard of living declines. It goes down. We tried capitalism. Well, maybe not the purest form of capitalism as I would like it, but we tried pretty close to it. We tried it in the West during the 19th century. Certainly in the United States it was tried for most of the, you know, from really from the founding of the country till early part of the 20th century. And what were the results there? What happened in America during the 140 years in which the economy of the country was free of government controls, government regulations, where it was left alone, where business was left alone? What happened? Well, in 1776, when the country was founded, the United States was a third-rate colony of Great Britain. I mean... The Brits know that the reason the Americans won the War of Independence uh, has nothing to do with the, with, the, with the Americans. It has everything to do with the fact that the United Kingdom was too busy. It had bigger fish to fry. They were called the French and the Spanish. <laughs> it wasn't that important, these 13 colonies. And yet, within 140 years, by the break out of World War I, the United States was the strongest, most powerful industrial military country in the world by far. Those 140 years 
generated the highest economic growth in human history. The United States absorbed tens of millions of immigrants. And we're not talking about really intellectual, uh, well-educated, uh, you know, immigrants. We're talking about the ancestors who came to America. We're talking about the poor, the uneducated. We're talking about the people that nobody in Europe wanted. And yet, they did phenomenally well when they came to America. They came, they built, they created stuff. They built the richest, wealthiest country in human history. And it's a consequence of the fact that during this period of time, America was a free country. It was free of all those interventions that are so common today. It was free of government controls, of regulations. There were no real regulations of business. There were no real government controls of what was going on in the economy. So you had an economy that boomed. And yet, starting in the 1930s, the United States has systematically turned away from that kind of economic system. Turned away from capitalism, turned away from free markets. We've tried every mixture of capitalism and socialism in between. We've tried a little bit of capitalism and a lot of socialism, a little bit of socialism and a lot of capitalism. We've tried all the different economic systems, and you can plot them on a graph. You can create a graph of wealth creation versus the amount of economic freedom. And what do you find? That the more economic freedom you allow, the greater the wealth creation. The greater economic growth, the greater the prosperity. So all the data lines up, all the historical data lines up to suggest that free markets actually work, they actually produce the goods, they actually create the wealth, they create a vibrant, wealthy society. And you can see it even today, if you look at, uh, I don't know, uh, how, uh, how many of you, has anybody here been to Hong Kong? Hong Kong, a few of you. It's worth going once in life to go see Hong Kong. Hong Kong 70 years ago was a fishing village on a rock in the middle of nowhere. And on that fishing village, the British basically established the rule of law. They protected property rights and nothing else. There's no regulation of business or very little, very, almost no safety net, almost no existing safety net. And yet millions of people from all over Asia flock to this little rock in the middle of nowhere. And today you go to Hong Kong and it puts New York to shame. It's got skyscrapers, seven and a half million people live on this tiny little rock. It's vibrant, it's energetic. GDP per capita, that is wealth per capita, is the same as the United States. Within 70 years, we've gone from a fishing village to one of the wealthiest cities in the world. How? Because of economic freedom. Because people were left alone to build and create and they weren't told what and how and when to do it. There's no redistribution of wealth. There's no government provided health care. There's basically free markets in Hong Kong. And yet people from all over Asia would love to live there because the standard of living there, even of the poor, is higher than anywhere else in Asia. So we've got examples of free markets working and they're right in our face. All you have to do is travel the world and you can see them. Yet you go to other countries where government is heavily mingled in those societies, controlling, regulating, taxing, redistributing, and their economy struggle. And you don't see the kind of economic <coughs> So why is it that we turn away from economic freedom? Why is it that we turn away from free markets and capitalism? And you know, it's not that we don't understand why capitalism works. We've had great economists, whether it's Milton Friedman or Hayek or von Mises and there are lots of others, who ex can explain in great detail why capitalism and free markets work and why socialism and government intervention in the economy doesn't work. This is not a mystery as to why these things function. And yet, it doesn't matter. We still turn away we still move towards socialism. 
we still move towards massive redistribution of wealth, massive regulations, and the consequences are all around us. I know here in the Bahamas, you guys are suffering from the recession that we're suffering in the United States, but we're still suffering. The economy in the United States is barely growing. Unemployment is very high. And it's not like anybody's projecting that the economy in the United States is going to suddenly grow very fast. Everybody's now accepted that it's not going to grow. And if you, I mean, there are many economists who understand that the reason for that is the growth of government, the extent to which government today regulates and controls and manipulates the economy of the United States. And it doesn't seem to matter. All this knowledge doesn't seem to matter. We grow it even more. We allow government to do even more. We re-elect Obama. We re-elect officials that are just going to increase government intervention in the economy and decrease the ability of the economy to grow into the future. There's something about capitalism. There's something about free markets that we, deep down, instinctually, at a gut level, resent and hate and turn away from. Every crisis that happens, the financial crisis right now, every crisis that happens, we blame on whom? For the last 2,000 years, we blame all financial crises on the same people. Anybody want to take a guess? Bankers, right? We always blame the bankers. We blame bankers, and we blame capitalists, and we blame free markets, even when economists later on can look back and say, oh, no, they didn't cause that. It doesn't matter. So we still teach, in America at least, that the Great Depression was caused by Wall Street, the Great Depression in the 30s. Well, it wasn't. No real economist thinks that. It was caused by government policies, really, really bad government policies. doesn't matter. We still teach that. We still believe it. We, we believe that this financial crisis right now was caused by whom? Who do we blame it on? Before the data was even in, before we knew anything about what happened, we blame it instinctually on Wall Street, on banks. And yet, again, any decent economist, maybe not today, but in five years, I can guarantee you, will see what is obvious, which is this financial crisis was caused by government, by government policies, by the Federal Reserve, by regulations, by the incentives that the government created for the bankers. Doesn't matter. We'll still blame Wall Street, and the response will be to regulate it more, to control it more. So what is it about capitalism that is so offensive? What is it that we don't like about capitalism? So what are markets about? What is capitalism about? Real question. When I say capitalism, what, what, what's it about? Creating wealth. What do you say? Free markets. Free markets. But, so, so what's free markets about? What? Creating, wealth. Creating wealth, but why? What are, what are people doing in the market? So Free choice of investment. Let's, let's take this as an example. Steve Jobs makes the, he used to, right, when he was alive, make these, right, iPhones. Why did he do it? What motivated Steve Jobs? To make money. Profit, right? He was there to make money. He was there to make money. You know what the profit margin on one of these is? At least the, the original, the first iPhone. Anybody know what the profit margin was? 60%. 60% profit. He made a fortune off of these. Okay, my Apple today is the largest corporation in the world because they make a lot of money off of this stuff. So Apple makes this to make money. What else? Is it just about money? Was Steve Jobs just about money? Are people in business just for money? <laughs> it's what we want. So... Innovation, he loves this, right? He enjoys it. He likes making beautiful things. He likes making things that come up in his mind and he can project out there into the world and build them. And he, he loves to make things. Whose image are these after? iPhones, Apple is about whom? Steve Jobs got to be up every morning and he said, I want to make beautiful products for whom? For us, the consumers. You think so? For himself. <laughs> you know how many customer surveys Steve Jobs did, Apple does today? You know, uh, focus groups. You know how many focus groups they do before they release a product? Zero. None. They don't care what you think. <laughs> they, don't, they don't care what I think. They know that they're really good at this, that they create beautiful products, and whatever they build, guess what? We will buy. 
right? So why did they make an iPhone? Because it's in their self-interest. Apple makes iPhones that make money because it's fun, because they enjoy it. It's about Apple. It's about Steve Jobs. Businessmen go to work every day to make money, to have fun, to do something challenging. They don't get up every morning and say, how can I make my fellow man better off? How can I maximize social utility? They don't. Businessmen are out there for whom? Themselves. Now, when I went and bought my first iPhone, it was 2008, and the U.S. economy was spiraling out of control, right? And I went to the mall and bought my first iPhone because I wanted to stimulate the economy. Because <laughs> I know that's why you guys go to the mall, right? You guys go shopping because you care about your fellow man, and you want to make sure other people have jobs, and you buy stuff so that they can have work, right? Anybody? No, right? Why do you go shopping? Because you want something. You want something that'll make you look good, that'll make you feel cool, that'll make you more productive. You want something. It's for you. So when you go to the marketplace, when you participate in capitalism, if you will, why are you doing it? For whom? For you. So what is capitalism about? It's about people doing what? Pursuing their self-interest. Capitalism is all about self-interest. And this is not new. This is not me making this up. Adam Smith. Everybody know who Adam Smith was? Wrote the Wealth of Nations. By what year would you write the Wealth of Nations? 1776. 17, Very good. Adam Smith in the Wealth of Nations says the baker bakes the bread not because he likes you. He doesn't really care about you. He bakes the bread. Why? Why does the baker bake the bread? To make a profit. So he can feed his family. So he can feed himself. So he can go to the mall and buy stuff for himself. Right? The grocer who sells you the bread, does he care about you? No, he doesn't care about you. He's just doing it for himself. He needs to feed himself, feed his family. Capitalism is the system of self-interest. Capitalism is about people pursuing their own self-interest. Now, what do we what do we be taught about self interest? What do we think about self interest? From when we were this big, right? Some of you are almost this big. Right? When we were really young, what about parents and our teachers and our preachers and really everybody taught us about self interest? It's bad. It's bad. I mean, I grew up in a in a, in a good Jewish household. My mother, like every good Jewish mother, taught me. Think of others first. Think of yourself last. What does virtue and nobility and goodness mean? It means selflessness, right? It means thinking of others first. It means sacrificing. That's nobility. That's goodness. That's virtue. That's the essence, right? But what's capitalism about? It's about being self-interested. And yet virtue means selflessness. Capitalism can't be virtuous because it's not selfless, it's not self-sacrificial, it's not about placing other people first. <clears throat> You've got a real conflict. And I would argue that at the end of the day, people don't vote their pocketbook. They don't vote economics. They don't vote what will make them richer. They vote what they think is right, what they think is just. And here's a system that is about self-interest when we be taught self-interest is bad. It's wrong, morally wrong. It's not just, it's not fair. What's just and fair is equality, sharing. Somebody said sharing before, right? Sharing, it's about being selfless. It's about giving, not, right? People vote for that. So they vote constantly away from capitalism and towards socialism. This ethic. It's consistent with socialism, not consistent with capitalism. Take somebody like Steve, uh, like uh, Bill Gates, a different, uh, different high-tech entrepreneur, right? Take Bill Gates. Bill Gates made tens of billions of dollars for himself, right? Richest man in the world to watch. How did he make all that money? 
Who'd he take it from? Nobody. Who'd he take it from? Jobs. Steve Jobs. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> Who'd he take it from? How, how did he get 60, 70 billion dollars for himself? What did he what did he do? He sold products, right? And we bought them. We all bought Microsoft products. So let's say we paid a hundred dollars for a, a, a piece of software that Microsoft made. When we bought the product for hundred dollars, who lost in the transaction? Nobody. Nobody lost. How can that be? Right? You paid a hundred bucks. Microsoft got a. You got a piece of software. Who lost? Nobody. How much is the software worth to you if you paid a hundred dollars for it? Hundred dollars. How much? No, it's actually worth more than a hundred bucks. You wouldn't bother giving up the hundred bucks. It was worth exactly that. Right? You're not indifferent between the two. You want the software which means it's worth more to you than the 100 bucks in your hand. So you're trading something less valuable to you, the $100, for something more valuable to you, the piece of software. So you're better off because you bought the software. How about Microsoft? Are they better off? Yeah, because to them it's worth a lot less than $100. They make a profit. That's called trade. And trade is win-win. Both parties win. So Steve Jobs made $70 billion trading with people, making everybody traded with better off. Right? Everybody was better off because they traded with, with Bill Gates. They got software that was worth more than what they paid for it. So their standard of living all went up. Indeed, I would argue that Bill Gates touched every human being on the planet. And if you think about the impact Microsoft has had, on computer networks, on the internet, on the, ex on the existence of really everything we know about the information technology today. He's touched every human being on the planet and made all of our standard of living go up, improved our quality of life, and yeah, he made a lot of money in the process. So what do we think about Bill Gates? Good guy. As a culture, <clears throat> do we think he's a good guy? Noble, virtuous. I mean, maybe you do. As a culture, what do we think of it? Uh, we don't think of it very positively. Not from a moral perspective. We admire his business success. But while he was in business, people envied him. They resented him. When the Justice Department, you know, in America, the Justice Department went after him for, for so-called antitrust violations. People cheered. People, people enjoyed having him knocked down a little bit. He was not considered virtuous. Making money... That's self-interested. When did Bill When did uh, Bill Gates become a good guy? When he became a philanthropist. When he retired from Microsoft, set up a foundation, put tens of billions of dollars into the foundation, and started giving it away. So making the money, creating the wealth, impacting billions of people around the globe, that from an ethical moral perspective gets... Zero credit. Zero credit by the moral authorities in the world we live in. But giving it away, being philanthropic, that, now that's a good guy. That's generous, that's nice, because he's putting other people first. We live in a culture in which creating wealth, building stuff, making stuff, eh, giving it away, quit. That's weird. Where do you think you have more impact on the world? By building and creating and being in business or by being a philanthropist? I mean, seriously. By building stuff. You're creating wealth. All you're doing as a philanthropist is redistributing it. It's the business. It's the creation. It's the building. That's where the real action is in terms of rising standard of living, increasing wealth. Giving it away, eh, that's fine. Nothing wrong with it. But that's not the essence of goodness. And yet that's how our culture perceives it. I was at an awards dinner in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, where business leaders were getting Lifetime Achievement Awards. Right? So Lifetime Achievement Awards. And they had these long bios that introduced them. And in those long bios, they spent one minute on their business success, and nine minutes on their philanthropy and community service. Because we feel guilty for the business success. 
We feel guilty for making money. We feel it's selfish, right? It's self-interested to make money. Even though other people are benefiting, the fact that we're benefiting taints it, makes it unacceptable. We cleanse that guilt by doing what? By doing philanthropy, by giving it away. Somehow that is good because that's selfless. So my argument is, Ayn Rand's argument was, that we have set up a moral system that is incompatible with wealth creation. It's incompatible with building and creating and sustaining a capitalist economy, a free market economy. And indeed, that we're willing to give that up. We're willing to destroy capitalism. We're willing to destroy the wealth creation. We're willing to destroy businesses like Microsoft for the sake of this alternative, this morality that exists out there that really is dominated Western culture for hundreds, if not for the last 2,000 years. That we're willing to, to give it all up in the, in, in the name of what is good and what is just and what is right. And you see this in politics. The left, the, 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 the people who want us to move away from capitalism, talk almost exclusively in moral terms. They talk about what is fair and what is just and what is right. They don't talk about economic efficiency because they know they lose that argument. They talk about moral terms. They have the moral high ground. They dominate the moral high ground. So if we believe in capitalism, if we believe in, in free markets, we can't let them have the moral high ground. We can't just accept that capitalism is inconsistent with this morality. What we have to challenge, in my view, it's not the nature of capitalism. Capitalism is what it is. It's about self-interest. Adam Smith knew it. We know it. Everybody knows it deep inside. Everybody knows it's about self-interest. That's why most people resent it. What we need is to launch a defense of self-interest. What we need is a different moral code. What we need is to reject the idea that the purpose of life is to serve other people. That the moral purpose of life is sacrifice. That the moral purpose of life is selflessness. Ayn Rand asks a simple question in the face of that morality. And that question is, why? Why is your life not as valuable as your neighbor's life? Why is your moral purpose to serve your neighbor, not to serve your own life? She challenges the established ethical code and she presents an alternative. She says, no, the purpose, the moral purpose of life should be to make the most of your life. The moral purpose of your life should be to be the best human being you can be. To make the most of the one life you have on this earth. To try to achieve happiness. To try to achieve success. To pursue the values that are going to make you the best person that you can be. So when somebody builds a company, when somebody creates a business, and they're taking care of themselves and their families, what could be more noble than that? What could be more noble? What could be more important than taking care of your own life, of taking care of the materially what is required of your own life and the people you love. That's what morality should be about. It should be about your self-interest. What is truly good for me? Now, the obvious question is, but doesn't self-interest demand that one, what do we usually think self-interest is about? When we point to the kid in the schoolyard and say, you're being selfish. What do we mean? You're taking care of yourself? What do we mean when we point to somebody and say, you're selfish? That you're a lying-stealing SOB, right? <laughs> that you'll, you'll do whatever. You'll backstab, you'll lie, you'll cheat, you're going to get your way no matter what, right? That's what we mean by self-interest. But is that self-interest? Is it in your self-interest to lie, steal, and cheat? How many of you have ever lied? Don't, don't, do, don't. Do. <laughs> it sucks. Lying doesn't work. It only complicates life. It only makes life worse. What really is a friend in life is reality, is truth, is facts. Lying distorts all that. It mixes it all up. You don't get anything that you really want from lying. I mean, the best example of this in America, 
I hope you know this guy, right? But it's been Bernie Madoff. You know Bernie Madoff? <laughs> the guy who created this pyramid scheme. He stole from his best friends billions and billions of dollars. He's in jail right now. He was turned in. Who turned him in? Who turned Bernie in? His sons, right? His children. One of them committed suicide a year after he was caught. So this guy's life is a complete disaster. Bernie says he's in jail right now. He says he's happier in jail than he was before he was caught. Because lying, cheating, is so horrific on your soul. It makes your life miserable. You can't look at your best friend. You can't, you're, you're constantly afraid of being caught. Not of being caught by the police, <coughs> by being caught by your friends, by your family. It just doesn't work. You know, I'm, I'm at the age now where I can barely remember what happened last week. It's true, it'll happen to all of you too. Um, if I lied about what happened last week, I'd have to remember two things. <laughs> what really happened and what I lied. But actually, I'd have to remember many more than two things because with every lie now, you have to remember who you lied to, why you lied to them, who you didn't lie to, why you didn't lie to them. Lying is just too damn complicated. It's just not worth the effort. And that's true of cheating, it's true of stealing, it's true of all this stuff. People don't actually reap the benefits. It doesn't actually lead to a happy, successful, flourishing life. It's a disaster. So traditionally, traditional morality has presented us with two alternatives. Be selfless, self-sacrificial, Mother Teresa, right? The ideal of morality. Nobody actually wants to be her, but we all believe that she was good, right? I mean, if we all wanted to be Mother Teresa, what are you doing here? You could be, in, you could be somewhere helping people. That's one alternative. And the second alternative is lying, stealing, cheating, being an SOB. I'm saying there's a third alternative. Being really self-interested. Pursuing your life. Trying to achieve flourishing. Aristotle, this is Aristotle, the famous Greek philosopher, talked about virtue as achieving individual human flourishing. Living life to the fullest. You're a human being. You've got so much potential. There's so many things you could be doing. Exercising your faculties to achieve a huge amount. That's what somebody like Steve Jobs did. That's what somebody like Bill Gates does. To me, they're moral, moral heroes. Because they made a lot of money. Which means they produced stuff, they created stuff, they built stuff, they built a life for themselves. They took care of the people they cared about. And by the way, they helped all of us at the same time. By trading with us. So... They're the heroes, not the villains, and giving it away, giving it away gets no credit in my book. I mean, it's nice, it's fine, but their impact on the world, on their own life, and on everything else is much greater by building and creating stuff. <coughs> and when we deny people the ability to build and create stuff, in, in America, when we, when we give them a welfare check and tell them, don't work, here's money, we'll, give it, we'll take care of you, don't worry about it. We deny them the ability to build and create to take care of themselves. We cripple them. The biggest victims, in my view, of welfare are the welfare recipients. Because where do you get happiness in life? Where do you get, where does happiness come from? What do you need in order to be happy in life? You need to be? You have to accomplish something. Because happiness comes from self-esteem. You cannot be happy unless you have self-esteem. And self-esteem is not earned by the ribbons that your teacher gives you. Indeed, nobody can give you self-esteem. Only you can attain self-esteem. You attain it by accomplishing things and recognizing your accomplishments. Where do we get most of our self-esteem? Where do we make most of our accomplishments in life? At work, by building creating stuff by making something if you deny people work you deny them the ability to get self-esteem and to become happy now you can be a poor bricklayer that makes you know a, a very low wage but is taking care of himself taking care of his family 
maybe sending his kids to school. You know you've accomplished something. You gain that self-esteem. You can be happy. You can be middle class. You can be rich and not do anything with your life. You will never be happy. Happiness doesn't come from money. It comes from accomplishment. It comes from success. It comes from working hard. And you, if you deny that to people, you deny their ability to attain happiness and success. So what Rand is advocating for is a morality of accomplishment, a morality of success, a morality of individualism, a morality of self-interest. And what's the one, what's the most important value that we as human beings need to pursue if we care about our own life? What's the most important value that creates really everything that we have around us? So here's the, here's the experiment. Look, look at your neighbors. You can look. It's okay. They're not that good. <laughs> We're a pretty pathetic animal. We're a pretty pathetic animal. We're slow. We're weak. We don't have claws. We don't have fangs. You know, try running down a bison and biting into it. Can't do it. You saber to tiger who wins? Saber to tiger. And yet here we are in this building with a video camera, living the good life. And where's the saber to tiger? Extinct. So how did we survive and they going out of existence? What is it that makes it human makes it possible for human beings to survive given how weak we are? Our minds. Our ability to reason. Our ability to be rational. So if you want to be self-interested, what is the most important thing to cultivate? What is the most important thing to allow to flourish, to activate, to engage it? It's your mind. It's your rational, reasoned faculty. And you have that, each one of us as individuals. That's a characteristic of an individual. There's no group thing. There's no collective consciousness. There's only you and your mind. If we could win... If we could change people's perspective with regard to morality, if you think about people who want to pursue their own happiness, who want to be successful, who are committed to using their mind, what kind of political economic system do people like that want? Do they want paternalistic mother government sitting on their shoulder telling you, don't do that, don't drink that sugary drink, it's not good for you? Do they want to be told what to do and how to do it and when to do it? No, they want to be left alone. They want to be free. They want to be able to go out and engage in the world and make something of themselves. And they want a political system that makes that possible. So if we want freedom, if we want a higher standard of living, if we want markets and capitalism and all the good stuff that markets and capitalism provide, my argument to you today is that what we need is not an economic revolution, not a political revolution. What we need is an ethical revolution. We need to reject the idea of selflessness. We need to reject the idea that morality is about sacrifice. We need to reject the idea that you are your brother's keeper, that you are the servant of somebody else, that your life belongs to other people. Those things need to be rejected into the heap pile of history. We need a new moral code, a moral code that emphasizes your value as an individual. Your life doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to you. You need to live it for yourself. You need to make the most of it. And you need to figure out the rules, the principles that allow you to achieve the most in your own life. That's what morality is for. What are the virtues? What are the values that are going to make you the best human being possible? If we can do that, if we can reorient the culture around a morality of the pursuit of happiness, then we can have all the benefits of capitalism. Then capitalism can flourish and be successful without you know, the, the cultural backlash against it. So I urge you, and that's what we do in the book, we urge you towards a moral ethical revolution to save the benefits of capitalism that accrued to us over the last hundred years. Thank you all. You're up for Q and A. Absolutely. So, only reason to give a talk is to have a Q and A. <laughs> Where do you draw the line in 
self-policing by capitalism, the capitalism system, so that, and I use the term loosely, there is an actual truth, an opportunity by all to enjoy the capitalism. When you have, and use a current event, people like Lance Armstrong suing people who are actually publishing the truth and totally destroying their lives. Yeah. And there's no way those people could self-actualize for themselves because here was a capitalist, in essence, ignoring the rights of others. Where is the mind of capitalism policing itself? Well, I think, first of all, I think capitalism needs to police itself in the sense that you've got to set a system of rule of law that protects property rights, um, and then you let the system run its course. In the, I mean, Lance Armstrong is a great example, because what he was trying to do was not sustainable. Now, yes, he's a bad guy, and he's caused a lot of people a lot of pain, and he is going to suffer for it. He's already suffering but for they it. But the people he's hurt have already Look, suffered. Look, there's suffered. always bad guys. You can, no matter what system you set up, they're going to be, there's going to be a Bernie Madoff, right? you got to catch them quickly and put them in jail, right? That's the secret. Now, what happens in the system we have today in the States is the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, responsible for catching Bernie Madoff, is so busy monitoring the behavior of innocent people, they don't have time to look for the frauds. They don't have time to catch the crooks. But well, that's what I'm saying. Where do you draw the line? Well, well, you have to define what being a crook is and go after them. And in my view, the line is coercion. Anybody who uses fraud or force to take stuff that doesn't belong to them is a crook. And that's the job of government, is to go after those guys. Everybody else should be left alone. That doesn't mean they're not going to be any motives. It doesn't mean they're not going to be crooks. Bad stuff is still going to happen. But most of us are going to be left free. And most of us are not victims of those kind of bad stuff. Yes? Why, why, I'm fascinated by what you're saying, and agree with it a lot of it, but why is it either or? Why can you not be selfless <coughs> and also be a good capitalist? So why can't you be selfless and be a good capitalism? Because capitalism is not about being selfless. Capitalism requires, to be a good capitalist, requires thinking about what you want to do, how you're going to do it. It, it requires complete absorption into your self-interest, into making the most of the product, of the, of the business, of your own life. And selflessness is... Moving away now, again, I don't associate charity with selflessness. I think charity can be self-interested. So I'm not against charity. I'm not against being benevolent or being nice to people. You have to be nice to people, otherwise they won't trade with you. Charity can be in your self-interest. If you're promoting causes, if you're helping people you care about. What I'm arguing is that it's, that is not your moral duty. Your moral duty is to yourself, is to your own life, is to your own flourishing. If and if everybody did that, if everybody did that, we would be in paradise. That assumes that everybody is equal, and they're not. You have the poor and the indigent, the people who are incapable, disabled people, the rest of it. I mean, you can't have the extreme attitude, otherwise life wouldn't work. No, I disagree with you. I think that it's the lack of an extreme attitude that makes life not work. I think that extreme attitude is what would make life work. I think the, the poor would be far better off under a system of self-interest, under a system of pure capitalism, than they are in our redistributive society today. And I think history suggests that. Again, the poor in Hong Kong are far better off in Hong Kong than they are in the very many other Asian countries where then they're not just left alone. Uh, the, the poor in America in the 19th century rose up from poverty much faster than the poor do today when they're being helped and coddled and giving checks and everything. And they were much happier and had much more self-esteem and much more confidence and did more good for themselves than they would with a mixed economy. So no, I'm a radical. I believe that when you leave people free, when you don't coerce them, when you don't take money away from them, when you don't tell them their moral obligation is to serve, but you tell them their moral obligation is to serve themselves, is to make the most out of their own lives, that's when they are happy and successful and prosperous. I'm completely advocating for an extreme form of society. 
you're on. Um, if you follow the capitalist influence, street, and you become the best person you can be, and you are self-serving, and at the same time you are moral and ethical, you cannot help but become a caring person. It, it's almost as if you become um, compassionate, that you become interested in, in others as a consequence of the lifestyle that you live. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think there's any conflict in that sense. Right. But that's not being selfless. That's being selfish. It's being self-interested, caring about people. Why? Why do you care about them? You care about them because what could be a greater value to you as a human being than other human beings? They're the greatest value that can be to you. I would argue the opposite. I would argue that a society of self-interested people is more benevolent and more charitable and more friendly and more caring than a society where we're raised to believe that our moral duty is to serve others and, that they, and, and if you're poor, you have somebody else has to take care of you and you have to take care of the poor. What a society like that results in is envy and resentment and, and uh, you know, why is it, there's the rich guy over there. His moral obligation is to give me money. And he's not doing it, so I resent him. See, if I'm self-interested, my view is if he's made a lot of money, that's great. That means he's provided me or the people I like and love with a service that we value. So you realize that there's no conflict between people. That other people's success is your success. It's a win-win relationship. Altruism, selflessness creates win-lose situations. So yes, I agree. And, and and the fact is, the free societies are the most benevolent societies. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You know, our government, our political leaders here, would always deny being socialist. They'd run a mile yeah. to avoid being called socialist. And yet, from what you see of government here and in similar countries, what do these governments do, although they don't claim to be socialist, what measures do they follow which have the effect of limiting free markets very seriously? Well, I mean, there are hundreds of things that they do, almost everything that they do in the United States, which I know, 95% of what the government does is limiting free markets. They redistribute wealth on a massive scale. So they take people's money and they give it to somebody else. That's limiting your freedom. You made that money. It's your money. They don't have a right to take it. Second, they regulate. They regulate every aspect of a business. In California today, if you want to shampoo hair, you need a government license. <laughs> shampoo hair. Right? I'm not even talking about starting a bank, which requires massive amounts of regulations and controls and, and restrictions. I mean... There's no accident that this financial industry in the United States had collapsed. It's the most regulated business in the, in, in, in the country. So everything that they do, every all these laws, Sarbanes-Oxley, Dodd-Frank, uh, Obamacare, all these laws are forms in which they restrict people's freedom and regulate. Now, you don't want to call it socialism? Fine. I mean, socialism technically is where the government owns the means of production. None of these countries are socialist technically. I call them statists, right? They're all statists, where the state is the primary actor in the world out there. And, uh, you know, you could argue that our countries, particularly the United States, are much more fascist than they are socialist. You know, fascism, they control the economy without owning the means of production. They use regulations in order to control. But they're all statists. They all involve the primacy of the state over the individual. And that's what we're doing. Yeah, um, I'm of the belief that most individuals, their moral principles stem from their spirituality or their, you know, their just beliefs. So, so are you saying that they should put that off, you know, and just follow a life of something else, you know, neglect their spiritual walk? Because a lot of people are motivated spiritually, you know, spiritual walk, it, it teaches you to be selfless and to help others and you know when you look at Christ and Confucius or whoever they, they with God they, they serve you know what I mean um, 
that's what it promotes. I'm so, saying I'm saying that Confucius and Christ, as understood by most people, I'm not a theologian, so I don't want to debate religion right now. Right. As understood by most people, are inconsistent with economic freedom and economic success and capitalism. That's what I'm saying. Uh, and I'm and I'm saying yes. I'm saying I'm challenging you. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm challenging you to rethink what spirituality means because I consider myself spiritual. And I don't believe in Confucius or Christ. I still consider myself spiritual because we're all spiritual beings. We have a consciousness. We're not just atoms. We're not just you know material. So there is a spiritual element, but that spiritual element, I, I'm, I'm challenging you to rethink it. I'm challenging you to ask the question: Why should I like my neighbor like myself? I don't. I doubt any of you like your neighbor like yourself. <laughs> and this is the test I give people. This is the test I give people. Do you love your children? Many of you don't have children. Imagine you had children. Do you love your children more than your neighbor's children? Everybody says yes. But that's wrong. That's wrong. You should love everybody the same, supposedly. And I'm saying no. I'm saying it's good that you love your children more than the neighbor's children. They're yours. They're your responsibility. You brought them into the world. You should love them more, embrace that, cherish that, don't feel guilty about it. Now expand that to a whole morality. Think about your life. You value your life more than other people's lives. That's a good thing. Now embrace that. Now does that mean, as the gentleman said before, does that mean you're going to be rude to people? Does that mean you're going to be mean to people? No, because they're a value to you. So you're going to be kind. You're going to be charitable. You're just not going to be selfless. You're going to place... You're gonna, you're gonna be nicer to people who are good than to other people. You're gonna, you're gonna treat people the way they deserve, not the same. Equality generally is overrated. The whole concept of equality. So it's basically, postmodern thinking like love yourself, basically. Love yourself, yes. I think you should love yourself, absolutely. I mean, I think you should be worthy of your own love um, first. But yes, I think you should love yourself. Yes. I'm Randy Ford. I'm Randy Ford. Hi, Randy. Thank you for bringing all your students. I, I hope you're not regretting it. I'm sure they're very intrigued. The challenge is, though, with, with, with capitalism and the whole idea of rational self interest, is what do you do now? When Adam Smith wrote in 1776 about the nation, basically the United States was a a, a, a country full of resources, yes, origin resources, so to speak. Yeah. But in society as we have it today, they have um, capitalism has already flourished. <coughs> what you have happening is that it's already reached I assume, its maximum level where you have this economic efficiency and you have this huge inequality. What do you do when you have mass inequality as a result of capitalism? Well, I'd argue two things. One is, I don't believe that the inequality that we have today in America, at least, is a result of capitalism. Uh, it's much more a result of statism. I think that inequality would actually be, would be less in the United States if you actually have freedom. And what, what is important about inequality? I don't think what's important about equality is the absolute difference between poor and rich. Uh, that's always going to exist. And I don't know what the, what the level would be under a completely free society. I have, a, I have a view that right now cronyism is exasperating that because of government, not because of capitalism. But put that aside. In a free market, you would have a difference between rich and poor. The question is not what the difference is. The question is what are the opportunities. The question is, can the poor become rich? And capitalism, the history of capitalism suggests that there's no society in which there's more social mobility than under capitalism. Then in capitalism, the fact that you're born poor does not mean you stay poor. Quite the contrary. There are enormous amounts of opportunities to become middle class and to become rich. And under capitalism, the other thing is that the absolute level of poverty is far higher than it is in other systems. That is, the poor are much, much better off. I mean, I was in Cambodia a few years ago. In Cambodia, you see poverty. Okay. No electricity, no running water, people living on houses on stilts because it floods, and they, the house has to be way high so that it doesn't get flooded, right? That's, I mean, that's the kind of, that's how all of us, all of human beings lived 300 years ago. 
So capitalism is what right raises us out. Now, what do we do given the reality today? We've got this allocation already. I say give us freedom. Let people be free to exercise their abilities so that they can rise up from whatever station they were born into in life. And there is no equality. We're never going to be equal. We've all got different parents, and we've got different genes, and we've got different skills and different aptitudes. Let's embrace that. That's wonderful that we're not the same. It would be boring if everybody was like me. I'd hate it. I like the diversity and the fact that everybody's different. Right? And that's what creates a marketplace. It's why we trade. If we all valued everything exactly the same, there'd be no trade. Trade is a consequence of the fact that we value things differently. So let's embrace the fact that we're different and unequal, but let's create the environment which rewards ability. And you talk about natural resources. Let me just say something about that. My view is there's only one resource. There's only one resource, and that's the human mind. It's the human mind. It's up here. So the resources have been used up as long as they're human beings. We can figure stuff out. We can invent new stuff. What used to be junk today could be a resource. You know that black gooey stuff that was in the ground once. People thought it was a. It was, you know people thought it was a nuisance until they discovered somebody figured out that you can make kerosene with it and light everybody's lives up. It only became a resource because of the human mind. It was just gooey black stuff that nobody wanted. It's we who create stuff. So resources are infinite because the human mind's capacity is infinite. Are there any examples in terms of economic -ism, socialism, communism, uh, fascism, whereby the social dynamics of poverty rising has ever been successfully implemented? As, as you're bringing up. Yes, I mean, I mean, there has never been a system to ever do that other than capitalism. No. Socialism has not worked. You can't <laughs> you name a model where it's worked in, in, in terms of, uh, of increased the economic output and rising poor. Uh, no, look, capitalism is the great, for, for the poor, capitalism has been the greatest system in human history. I mean, again, 300 years ago, all of us were poor. All of us were poor, worse off than the Cambodians, the poor in Cambodia were. I mean, we forget. We don't forget. We can't remember, right? We don't know history. But where were we 300 years ago? I mean, most of us weren't here because the population was so much smaller, right? And then we were all subsistence farmers. We had nothing, literally nothing. And we died before we reached age 40. What led us to where we are today, where we can live long lives, where we live in decent houses, where we have air conditioning, where we have automobiles. I mean, that's capitalism. It's ra ra raised all of us out of poverty. And it's the only system that does it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, he's pointing in this direction. Yes. Yes. And then I'll go to you. Yeah. yeah uh, well, you, you said on so many words that, that capitalism itself, it, it, it assumes that the person should be self-interested enough to notice that the community is more important to himself. But that isn't a typical example of <coughs> capitalism. Like, capitalism typically verifies persons that steps out from that community and kind of think, and thinks about just himself. How do you reconcile that? So I didn't. I, you know, I, I don't want you to interpret what I said as as saying that yourself that capitalism encourages a self-interested view that ultimately leads to viewing the community as more important than you. I don't. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you should view your life as the most important thing, and you should cultivate your life. I believe that if you do that rationally and properly. You will value the other people in the community, not more than you, but value them for you because they're value to you. And I believe that capitalism <laughs> cultivates exactly that kind of person. So think about, think about a Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. I mean, by building the companies that they built, think of what they did to the communities around them. They created millions of jobs, millions. If you think about all the other companies that had a great product for Microsoft and all the people employed in Microsoft, they created a rising standard of living for everybody around them. And then, you know, if they wanted to be charitable, they, they gave so many out. 
Steve Jobs, as far as we know, was not charitable at all. At all. But so what? But think of the benefits he created. And I think if you look at the Rockefeller, Carnegie, and all the great industrialists, they've always you know, helped the community, not because they valued the community above themselves, but because it was in their self-interest to do so. What I'm saying is, well, let me follow up with this now. The, the human beings typically think towards more towards minds of we, we we're more community. Human beings more as community, right? What you're asking persons to do is just to think totally self-interested and then to and then to guess or or, or even to some extent that they would just magically start to think about, you know, seeing other things within their self-interest. No, because I, I I don't think we're primarily so I think we're communal. There's no question we need other people. We benefit enormously from other people. The more self-interested you are, the more you think about what's good for you, the more you realize you need other people. Now, not anybody, but you want somebody to love, you want friendship, and you want traders. You want people to trade value for value. You want employees. You, you can't build and create without other people. So you develop relationships, but the relationships are not sacrificial relationships. They're not selfless relationships. They're self-interested relationships. I love my wife. Not because I don't care about myself. I love my wife because I love myself. Because I'm self-interested. The most self-interested emotion you can have is love. I mean, it makes you feel great. It's really cool. <laughs> right? You want love. Now, I, when I married my wife, I married her for selfish reasons. Because I love her. I didn't marry her for selfless reasons. I didn't marry her for her. I married her for me. Hopefully she married me for her. That's the beauty of the trade, right? You don't want to sacrifice yourself for other people. You don't want to make your life less for other people. And you don't want other people to sacrifice for you. You don't want to make them your servants either. I, I'll ask for a question. Uh, when, you, when you mentioned Bernie Madoff in particular, he was acting pretty, pretty self so. See, I don't think so. My argument is that Bernie Madoff was self-destructive, that he acted in self-destructive ways, not self-interested ways. That if Bernie Madoff had sat down and thought, remember I said reason? If he thought, what would make my life a good life? How can I make the, the best life that I can for myself? He would have never come up with the answer, a lie, steal, and cheat for my best friend. The problem with Bernie Madoff is he didn't think. I don't believe you can be self-interested if you don't think. If you begin to protect especially things like the state, things like regular, how do you So two things. One from these sociopaths. So one, if you're a sociopath and you do what Bernie Madoff did, in my world you go to jail. The same thing happened today in the world. And if you don't, if you don't commit crimes, you're just a jerk, right? Then you have a miserable life. Yes. I think the gentleman is confusing selfishness with rational self-interest. Yes. That is clear enough. Yes. So the difference is this. I'm advocating for rational self-interest, for a rational approach to ethics and to your own life and your own well-being. Bernie Madoff is not, was not rationally self-interested. In my view, he was self-destructive. I'm not advocating for doing whatever you feel like doing. Well, greed is a tricky word, but I'm not, I'm not advocating for doing it. So let's say there's a, a line of cocaine here, and it'll give me a high. It'll make me feel better. So you might say, oh, that's self-interested. I'm saying no, because if I thought about it, then I know that taking cocaine, what gives me a high right now, is not good for me long term. So I don't do it. So I'm advocating for, just like any moral code, no matter what your moral code is going to be, it's going to require you to think about what you want to do and what not to do. And I'm arguing for morality that says, think. Think about what's good for you. And do those things that make it possible for you to thrive in the long term. Don't go by emotions. Don't go by what people tell you. Don't go by whim. Go by your rational reason thought. Can I, can I follow him? Sorry, sorry, sorry. He's been waiting. No, no, I have, I have the guy in the back who's been patient. Yes. Yes. Um, 
you know, this, this is all well and good. How do we move forward? Because when you think about it, the, politi the political electorate, they want to keep you, quite frankly, illiterate, and they want to impose more regulations yep. on business people. Sure. And so that they continue to be elected, and it's, this is the they leave. How do we get to the next level where we change that? So this is my argument. My argument is that this is not easy. This is hard. We're failing. I'm arguing for a new approach. And that is that this is ultimately an educational battle. And this is ultimately a, a, a cultural battle about the kind of moral code that culture upholds as virtue, as goodness. I think we need to start challenging that. And I'll give you an example. I think, for example, business leaders need to start being proud of the fact that they're business leaders. Somebody like Mitt Romney should have been proud for making money, should have been proud for being private equity. He should have been able to explain what private equity is. He should have been able to say, I'm not in business to create jobs. No businessman is in business to create jobs. Stop claiming you're in business to create jobs. You're in business to make money. And you know what? If everybody succeeds in making money, jobs are created. But that's not the reason you're in business. Stop being apologetic. Be proud. Be so, you know, accept this morality and stand firm by it. And I think if we had some role models, if we changed the way we talked about language, for fairness, right? The left has this monopoly over fairness. What does fairness mean today? Equality. It never used to mean equality. What does fairness mean in the dictionary? Getting what you deserve, which is not the same as equality. So let's, let's every time Obama says fairness, or every time the left says fairness, or somebody says fairness, say, well, that's not fair. This is what fairness means. Let's take those moral terms, those moral concepts, and give them <coughs> real meaning, meaning that's consistent with capitalism and free market. I think then the economics and the politics fall into place if you can make those changes in the culture. It's hard. It's a long-term battle. But thats I don't see any shortcuts. Yes? Charities. Taking care of uh, But as soon as they passed the law and they started taking income tax, people said, that's why I have to do my tax. And so I don't have to worry about my next door neighbor anymore. And we become less and less human from that process. And I think that what you're talking about is national self where we recognize that we don't live in a voluntary exchange society. We live in a mandatory exchange society. Exchange to survive. Some people cannot exchange for one reason or another. And then how do we handle those people that determine society society we live in? If the private sector is in the middle, the public sector has to. And the private sector has stopped doing it. That's where capitalism is in a bad way. See, I, w I agree with a lot of what you said, but I don't agree with everything. Uh, I don't believe the standard of society is determined by what happens to those people who can't take care of themselves. First of all, it's a tiniest of minorities. It's, it's a tiny fraction of population that really take, can't take care of themselves. And that's what traditionally charity and all these other forms in the 19th century worked on. But it's not a significant number that, that are in a condition where they literally cannot take care of themselves. Uh, I, think a ch I think a society is measured by how successful people are in it, how successful they are in living, how successful they are in attaining values. And I think people who are successful and people who do are very charitable. This is why pre-1913 all this existed. If you go pre-capitalism, if you go to an era before capitalism, there was almost no charity because people weren't successful, because there was no wealth. People didn't, hadn't built up enough to take care of themselves, never mind take care of their neighbor. It's only capitalism that creates the wealth that makes charity even possible. But the first point is capitalism. The first thing you have to do is take care of yourself. The first thing to do is to build up the wealth and the capacity that you have. And then if you want, and I think most people do want, 
Then you take care of those who can't take care of themselves. But that's a secondary consideration. Another way to look at this is America didn't become this great nation because of charity. I mean, charity was there. Charity was important. But what created the great nation was work, was personal responsibility, was, was the genius of people like Edison and Ford and Rockefeller and people like that. It was the energy, the, the, the freedom. And that's where we need to be focused on. Charity at the end of the day is a secondary issue. It's not both for ethics and for economics. It's a secondary issue. The primary issue is taking care of someone. I agree with you. Oh, sorry. I said I, I misinterpreted you. I yes, agree. Then we like, agree. It's like buckle up yourself before you buckle up yes. your children. Yes, that's right. I thought you yourself wouldn't just say What's that that? charity is a secondary issue. Yes. With what an extreme entrepreneur with an excellent surplus of money, what should he do with his money? He should invest it. I mean, the fact is that he would do a lot more good for society and for himself by investing that money than he will any time from charity. The, the return on investment in terms of the benefit to humanity far exceeds what you can attain through charity. Now, it's up to him at the end of the day, right? In my view, every entrepreneur needs to decide what he wants to do with the money. If you enjoy charity, if there are important causes out there that you believe in, then give it away. Then set up a charitable foundation, engage in it, do it. But it's not morally mandated for you to do it. Buy, buy a big house, buy a yacht, live a good life. It's your life, it's your money. Do what you think will bring you the most happiness with you. But in terms of, if we think economically, if we think about what will do the world good, then the best thing to do with your money is to invest it, by far. The return, people have done studies, the return on investment far exceeds the return on charity. Particularly with large sums of money. Yes? Okay, um, you mentioned that in 140 years, or after the United States achieved that it was there was tremendous economic growth. Yes. Um, and you mentioned freedom as being an important component yes. of that. I have a question about the role or the significance of slave labor um, in that growth. And also, you said that um, rational self-interest would lead people to acknowledge that freedom um, of all individuals is great for society. But didn't government have to intervene? Didn't government intervention ensure that Yes. So, uh, the question is about the role of slavery in the economic growth in America during the 19th century, uh, during this period. I would argue that slavery generally is a net detriment to economic growth. It's a negative. So, to the extent, if there hadn't been slavery in the, in, in, uh, in the first 70 years, then the economy would have grown faster. Uh, slavery doesn't make any economic sense. It is. It is a. It, it, it's not a. It's not a moral strategy, and it's a bad economic strategy. Uh, trade, win-win relationships are what generate more economic growth and more economic success. It's by the way why the North, which didn't have slavery, grew much much faster from an economic perspective than the South did, and why the North in the end won because it was much more powerful, much stronger than the South. Now, I agree with you. Sometimes. You know, sometimes when rights are being violated on a massive scale, like with slavery, you need government to intervene to stop that. That's the role of government. The role of government in my world is only one, and that is to stop violations of rights. It's to protect us from force. So if I'm enslaving my neighbor, it's absolutely the job of the government to come and save, and, 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 and save my neighbor from it. But wasn't slavery a... Con it's a form of... Again, it's a, the job of government is to prevent coercion in society. And yes, it's, it's driven from morality, but it's not the morality of selflessness. It's in my self-interest not to have somebody else in slavery. Sorry, I just need to interject one thought there. Sure. Isn't, wasn't slavery a consequence of government policy in the first place? It was people rising up against it that forced them to change that lousy yes, policy. Yes, in the end, you know, slavery was government policy, and it was... Independent individuals, thinkers, uh, movement leaders, preachers, all kinds of people who rose up and in the end forced the North to go and, 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 and get into a war. And if it would left the government, they, they, you know, we'd still be where we were today, where we were back then. I mean, 
Yeah. Somebody who hasn't asked a question yet. Um, I, I agree with you, and I think you're stopping short. I'm an anarcho capitalist. Yeah. Um, if you truly believe the government is bad, they get money from taking money, taking money to the hard working people, which is theft. Yeah. Therefore, they operate without a price mechanism. Okay, and they, they have no idea how to properly use the scarce and value yeah. resources. Why would you want government at all? Good question. So I'm not an anarcho capitalist. I believe, cap I believe government is a necessary good. Necessary evil or necessary good? I said necessary good, and I said it on purpose. Okay. I believe it's a necessary good. I do not think you can have a functioning society without government. I think government has an important role. It has only one role, but it's a really, really important role. And that is to be that entity that monopolizes the use of retaliatory force. It is the one entity. Force, I don't believe you can have a marketplace in force. I don't believe you can trade force. I don't think force is a win-win. I think force is a different type of entity where you should not have a market in it. And we create a particular institution to control force. We call it government. You don't like the word government, we'll call it something else. I don't really care. But that's what government is. It's, it's an entity there to extract force from human relationship. And that's all it does. It's the only thing that it does. But your philosophy therefore are wrong because you're saying one thing if, 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 if we're talking about the production of goods and services yeah. and, the, and, and the protection of society, insurance is a good and or service. No, it's not. Yeah. See, I don't believe it is. Okay. I don't believe it's a good or service, and we can argue all nights, and I've done it many times <laughs> uh, with an alco capitalist. Force is not a good or service. Force is the... It's not about protection. This is about coercion. And coercion is not a good service. Coercion is the anti-market, it's the anti-mind, it's the anti-reason, it's the anti-life. It needs to be separated out, create an own institution for it that is separate than anything than anything else that is traded and, and where we actually have goods and services related to it. This is why this is why, for example, I'm okay today even with government having some regulation over weapons. Because it's an instrument of death. Weapons are an instrument of death. It's an instrument of coercion. There's no marketplace in, in atom bombs. There shouldn't be a marketplace in tanks. But, you know, we can have a long argument. Okay. Yeah. When you're talking to someone and you're talking about the virtue of selfishness, yes. how, do you, how do you stop the person you're talking to immediately following the word guilt in their mind? You, it's very difficult because, I mean, I, and I think, you know, again, I think Jewish and Catholic mothers figured this out a long time ago, that guilt is a great way to control people and manipulate them. self-interest is guilt, isn't it? No, self-interest is the opposite. But that's what 90% Yes, 90% people think. think, I'm self-interested, but I need to feel guilty. Why do I need to feel guilty? Because my moral code says self-interest is bad. I'm saying. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm saying. I'm you liberating say them to somebody. Their first reaction is, is that's guilt. Why would it be guilt? It's guilt because they hold the wrong moral code. So what I'm saying is, self-interest isn't guilt. Self-interest is the is the way to eliminate unborn guilt because people hold the guilt because they live self-interested <coughs> and they believe they should be Mother Teresa, and that causes the guilt. I'm saying, no, you shouldn't be Mother Teresa. There's nothing good about Mother Teresa. Right? I mean, we could discuss Mother Teresa, but there's nothing much good about Mother Teresa. Live your life. Make the most of it. You want to go to India and help people? You really think that'll make the most of your life? Do it. Nobody's stopping you. The point is, live your life based on your values. Be self-interested. Get rid of the guilt. Guilt is a way for people to manipulate you. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a way in which... Our religious and cultural and political leaders want us to feel guilty because then they can use that against us. They can manipulate us. They can control us. I wanted to liberate you from feeling guilty. I want you to embrace your self-interest. Self-interest creates self-esteem. Yes. Guilt destroys self-esteem. Self -esteem. Absolutely. I mean, that's the real issue. That's right. And that's the issue that, uh, you know... And guilt we, comes we, around because we buy into this alternative morality, which is wrong. Precisely. Yes. Well, I, you know, 
the advice would be to try to become an entrepreneur, to try to build your own business, to try to, you know, direction, but but to do that direction, I mean, A, getting a job is good training for being an entrepreneur. So, yeah, it's no fun working a 95 job, but you got to do it. Yeah. You got to do it because you'll learn the skills that then allow you to be an entrepreneur and do your own thing. Second is really think about what you want to do. Use this. Too, men, too much of an educational system, not impeding on, on your professor, but too much of an educational system is about emotions. It's about what do you feel? How would you, you know, that's not important. Not for success in life. What's important is what you think. It's figuring it out. It's, it's really spending time. You know, really thinking through what you want to do in your life. And the emotions will follow. The passion will follow. But you got to use what's between your ears. And you got to train yourself. To do that. I, can, I can answer that. I have two children who are, one of their passions about surfing. And the other is passionate about circus parts. He wants to be, he's doing trapeze and stuff. They're not going to be jobs that are going to make them a lot of money, but those are their passions. They are willing to wait on tables and do other jobs so that they can do that thing they love. And somebody needs to wait on tables. Absolutely. So if that's what's going to make them happy, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, and in the long term, what you want to do is pursue your passions and, and figure out how to do that. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is there a role for unions in the society? Is there a role for unions in a free society? They might be. I'm not, I mean, I don't think uh, capitalism is against unions as long as unions don't have special protection from the government. As long as they don't have coercive power given to them by the government, if they're voluntary associations, you can imagine situations in which certain manual labor, simple labor, people, it's easier for them to organize together to negotiate terms. But, you know, unions have been declining in the United States in spite of all the protection the government gives them. So I believe that the more you move towards a information society, the fewer and fewer, uh, the less and less unions make any sense at all. Yeah. I'm all for, you know, um, just living the life and going after what you want to do in life. I, yes. I believe in that. Yeah. I believe people should spread their wings, you know yes. what I mean, and be the best they can be. Absolutely. And, but it's like, I'm saying be proud of that. That's yeah, good. That's good. Yeah. And, and, and education is, is important too. Yes, it is. And, and for our society as Bahamians, I believe it was that, that socialism or that, you know, the statism that provided us with that education <coughs> initially in, in the 1970s, you know, when we came into independence. Yeah. Because before that, we didn't have that, you know, because my grandfather, he, he left school at age maybe 13 and he was able to go to school at age 58, yeah. you know, and he's 91 now and he's able to, you know, help and provide for others, you know what I mean, and also that social or statism provided um, college scholarships for persons during that era to go off to school. That's probably why a lot of us have the opportunity so to the, study economism. Or so there are two things. Like there are yeah. two things. There. One is, whether it's good or not, yeah. it's wrong. Yeah. Because, yeah, education might be very valuable to you. But does that give you the right to take my money? Does that give you a right to steal my money because it's good for you? Now, we understand that you, you won't... You're not going to come up with a gun and take my money and to use your education. That's wrong. But somehow we create a government that comes and takes my money and gives it to you for an education. That's right. No, it's still stealing and it's still wrong. So on a mall basis, taxes, taking money from people to give to other people, that's just thievery. That's just stealing. Let me finish. Second, in a true free market, now, and I don't know about Bahamas history and, and what kind of legal system it's on you had here. But in a true free market, you would have private education that would be so much better than anything the government could provide. You would have far superior products. If you had the profit motive in education, you would have people competing just like they compete today stupidly to make a better and better phone. Right? Think about the billions, the, 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 the brain power that goes into making a better phone. Imagine that brain power going into beta king a better educational product and selling it to you. 
So I'd like to see competition and innovation and a profit motive in education. I'd like to see it applied not just to phones and not just to technology, but to the most important product in the world, which is education. I think you're getting a third-rate product because it's public, because it's government. What's that? In the East, they're doing a lot of private education and replacing state education because they find the private sector can do it better and cheaper. Yes, private sector can do any service better and cheaper. Yeah. I think it's a fundamental problem or something that challenges a lot of people in charge. Sure. When you talk about his grandfather not being able to pursue higher education, you spoke, yes, okay, but you, you, you spoke about earning a livable wage. You said the government made a wage, they have to get their kids' families. Well, what do you do? I, I, I forget to ask earlier. What do you do with those individuals because of this marketing profession and public information? These individuals who don't have that opportunity, the child born with, with, with delinquent parents, alcoholics, what do you do with a child like that? Who's Nothing. That? Nothing. I mean, so, it, it, either somebody, no, no, nobody is. I mean, either, either somebody voluntarily chooses to help that child, voluntarily, or nothing happens with that child. Look, my, I'd have to go one generation earlier than you, right? My great-grandfather was born in a little village in Europe. He got no education. He, he had no opportunities. He got on a cart and went to the port and got on a boat, and he happened to go to South Africa. Some of them came to, uh, to, uh, to America, and they came to America, poor Jews, with nothing. They had absolutely nothing. They came through Ellis Island, and they went to work. And what did they have? Nothing. Now, within two generations, sometimes within one, their grandchildren were doctors and lawyers. And, and, but because the grandparent worked hard with nothing. They, they came from, they had delinquent parents. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Fiddle on the Roof. You ever see Fiddle on the Roof? We'll sing. Right? These were ignorant Jews who knew nothing about the world. And they left because they were being killed. Right? So they had no option. They left, and they worked hard, and nobody gave them anything, and nobody provided for them with anything. And some of their parents were alcoholics, and some of their parents were abusive, and so on. And people survived. I, I know a, a woman I just hired who's, you know, and you find these stories. She was the chief financial officer at Shell Corporation, right? And, you know, she, she grew up in foster, foster care, right, in, in foster homes. She didn't even have parents. People can raise themselves up if you provide them with the freedom, or provide them with the with the moral code that gives them that focus. You spoke yeah. about President Barack Obama. Yeah. If you were President Barack Obama, what would you do? Wow. I mean, you know, Ludwig Ludwig von Mises was once asked. If he was appointed, if you were appointed, he was asked, if you were appointed dictator of the world, and you could do anything you wanted, right, right now, what would be the first thing you did? You know what he said? Resign. Um, but let's just pretend, let's pretend, if I were president today, uh, exactly the opposite of everything he's doing. I would dramatically cut government spending across the board and start thinking of programs to completely eliminate. I would put a proposal on the table to do away over a generation and a half of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. I would deregulate. I would get rid of all the regulations. Everything the opposite of what they're doing today. Would that not be in, would that be in his best interest to do that? Yes. Yes. But he is not pursuing his self-interest. And no politician does. I mean, this is why they're typically pretty miserable. I mean, if it, if it oh, now you're shifting the question. Right. Now you're shifting the question. This is why Von Mises would resign, right? If the answer is, what are you going to do that's popular, then it's it's over. Rational self-interest we're talking about. Then I wouldn't be in politics. No rational self-interested person would go into politics as long as the culture is the way it is today. That's why the effort is not in politics. The effort needs to be in cultural educational change. It needs to be about educating people so that we can get to the point 
when I could do the right thing and still get reelected. But I, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.